Exactly. In fact, I did my mother's pen, and I thought, I mean, yeah. she looks very elegant and whatever. Look how And I look at her and think, I'm to wear a She looks classy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Alex. <laughs> All right, good morning. We were getting the technology set up today a little. My expert's not here, so. All right. <clears throat> Acts 5, 1 to 11 this morning. Um, so this is uh, not on your uh, daily calendar of inspirational passages for uh, the year, typically. So we'll see, we'll see what, we'll, um, what we'll make of it. But um, yeah, let's get started. So Rod, pray for us, please, and um, and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance we have to get together and talk about you and your will for us. Um, you've said that all, all the Bible is good for instruction, and so we pray that you will send your spirit that we can learn something from this passage today, that we will be able to uh, be better people. Um, for each other and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Jake, you ready to read for us? Sure. Excellent. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart so that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to just human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward and wrapped his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment... She fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these events. Mm. Inspiring passage to uplift us this Thanksgiving week. So uh, I want to, uh, I want us to consider three broad questions. And, and the first question is going to be uh, what, all right? We're going to do that first, and then um, I'm going to ask the question why, and then I want us to consider the question how, okay? So for those of you that are linear thinkers and like to know where we're headed, uh, that at least gives us a bit of a bit of a guardrails of where, of where we're headed. So the first question I want to ask you is, what 
are the possibilities. So I'm not asking you to give the right answer even, hear me clearly. I'm saying, what are the possibilities of the, 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 are the subject of this passage? Does that make sense? Are you with me? What is this passage teaching? And I'm not just asking you to give me the right. I just, what could this passage be teaching us? Does that make sense? So I want you to use your imagination. What is the subject or what might this passage be informing? And I'm going to make a list. So that's the what question. What could this be about? Yes, sir. So I'm thinking of principles of fundraising. All right. So <laughs> there, you can't. Yeah. Uh, Alan, you cannot. That, that clearly is a subject that's involved here. Is this a passage about fundraising? Good. So Alan has got us on the right train this morning. Tim. These things don't just happen in the Old Testament. All right. So you have this question of, is this the Old Testament God showing up here? Good. What else? Honesty. Okay. Is this a question of, is this a passage about honesty? What else? Kind of the same thing. Be sure that your sins will find you out. Oh, uh, private sins. Private sins being made public. Yes, sir. Marriage. Ah, interesting. It is most certainly has a, a, a marital dynamic. Um, Dan Lois. Uh, Holy Spirit. What okay. What is the Holy Spirit responsible? Okay, Holy Spirit How do we is involved. Respond? Is this a passage about the Holy Spirit? What else? Oh, sorry, Lois. Yeah. Greed. Okay, is this a passage about greed? Oh, this is delicious. Yes. Cause of death. Yes, and we must read the passage very carefully here. We must get to that as a question. What else? What? What might this? Yes. Fear. Okay. Fear. Uh, a lot of fear is involved here. What else? Regret. Kind of applied by some of the others, but commitment. Okay, is this a passage about commitment? Regret. I was just going to ask the same idea of commitment, devotion. Okay, devotion. What is this passage about? Other possible candidates. And by the way, Thank, thank all of you for playing, but some of these are going to be better than others. <laughs> because I ask you not to give the best. We're doing, a, we're doing some brainstorming about everything that it might be about. Yeah, okay, God's power. Aren't they in order of importance? <laughs> God's power. What else might it be about? What, what um, Old Testament story does this most close, closely approximate? Aiken. Thank you. Aiken, am I spelling it right? A-A-C-A-N? Yes. A-A-C-H-A? Yeah, you're right. A-N. Is that it? All of you are, are you don't know either. I like about this. He doesn't, he doesn't know. You, I don't know either. Uh, Aiken, so there's an Old Testament quality. Um, uh, can I add a couple? Is this um, about, is this an economic theory? Is this about uh, uh, economics that's been floated in the past? Yes. Authenticity or the lack thereof. Authenticity. Just trust if I give all my money away, I won't be able to take care of myself. Okay, so distrust in God? And God. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so distrust in God. Any other candidates that you'd like to put on the board? I don't know how to say this, but like in one word, but maybe you'll help me. I know that Melissa and I have oftentimes like whenever we're giving, like it the Lord loves a joyful uh giver. And and I guess it's it's really like a heart check, I guess. Like oh yeah, good. Motivation, maybe. Yeah, motivation behind yeah, your gifts. Yeah, good. Motivation or the heart. Before we start digging into this, anybody else want to put forth a candidate for what this passage is about? Yes. So I had to look at, back at this to see if we were talking about a tithe, because 
I don't know why this money was obligated to God. Yeah. So how am I going to put that, counselor? Mm, it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is about obligate, right? Is this is this obligatory, right? I mean, I think that's a real question. And I think, by the way, that question goes to a lot of the tenor of this passage is, is it obligatory? I think, I mean, that really goes to the heart of this. Yes. Well, thought is intention, because that, to the whole obligatory concept is there's something inherently wrong about giving half. Was it because there was this implied intention that they went back uh, on? Yeah. Or if the in original intention was to give half, what's wrong with that? Uh, another way, another way, I'll come back. Another way of framing this question is what is the sin involved here? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's another way of look. What, what is the fundamental problem in this passage that Ananias and Sapphira are up to? I mean, that becomes a real issue. I don't know if I can just tell it in a word either, but inauthenticity toward to that. Point. Yeah, inauthenticity. Did I? Oh yeah, yeah. Authenticity or <laughs> inauthenticity. Yes, I think right. You know, I, I coach I coach uh, fifth grade boys basketball, and the other day, um, one of the kids took off his shoe and was hucking it from half court into the hoop, trying to make it. And so one of the kids on my team said, "If you make that, I'll pay you fifty bucks." Mm -hmm. So the kid hucks it, actually makes the shoe in. And he's like, no, 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 I'm not paying $50, right? Uh, 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 <laughs> and so his integrity was, was severely challenged. So I actually, the very conveniently, the next practice, we gave a, a talk about don't promise unless you're willing to pay up. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> it, it, All right, no, no, I think shoe hucking goes to the heart of this passage, right? I mean, for, for, adults, too. for adults, like, yeah, if you're not willing to. You know? Know? Well, anything else sense. you want to weigh in on before we start to triage these a little bit kind of trust and faith from what the comment you just mentioned and it's yeah. probably already yeah tr distrust in god oh or okay yeah the trust that's good right. good thank you randy anything else you would like to say seems like many of those have to do with how the community functions ah uh, yeah what has the, and, and Rod has an unfair advantage because he taught last week. Who is this behavior in contrast to as a literary device here? Who did you talk about last week? I was not here. You, Barnabas. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure that was an enlightening conversation. Uh, it's, it's Barnabas, right? Is it Joseph Barnabas? Is that correct? And what, what did Joseph Barnabas do last week? Land. He sold land and he fulfilled his his uh, his pledge, right? Um, he he met the shoe hucking standard, right? Last week, and so um, one one way to look at in, anything in literature, but I think particularly a lot of biblical literature in antiquity, is you are you're contrasting characters, and I think Luke has a bit of a literary device going on here where he's talking about that we should see these two stories together. So Ananias and Sapphira, this is not just in a vacuum, Rod, to your point on community. We've had a run-up of this build of community now for four chapters in Acts. Acts 2, Acts 4, these kind of rich passages about what the, how this community is going to function, right? And so this becomes um, something that we see against the relief of how things should be functioning. This isn't, this isn't just out of nowhere this is contextualized where we have four chapters of this is how this should happen and now something is going to awry. and by the way um as a matter of a sign of historical uh credibility luke's um inclusion of stories like this shows that this is not just propaganda likely book of acts Does that makes sense like he the, the dirty laundry is getting aired here in the church and we'll see that come up um, all right, are we happy with this list? Good? Yes. Um, this is one of the early church made of imperfect people. I'm sure a lot of things similar like this yeah. may have happened. So were these people set as an example? Yeah. An example for of what happens with imperfect people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, it's certainly there. Absolutely. 
So, um, so this is where we're dwelling on the what question. What is this passage about? Um, so let me come back to the question I asked just a second ago. If you look at all this, what is the what is the violation here? So let's let's put a finer point on the question. What what's the violation? What's this? What's the sin? Let's just use the word. Right? What's the sin here? A lie. A lie. Okay. So the candidates would be. This is a lie. We agree. Even, uh, we well, we can agree on that, right? I mean, that seems like th th there's a lie, and the lie is what, John? Just spell it out. What is the lie? The lie is I did not sell it for the price that I actually did. Okay. The the Greek, and I would have put this word up on the board, except I was trying to get the technology to work this morning. But the Greek language for what had happened is the language in antiquity of a legal contract. So scholars believe, as we're reading this short passage, that in some way, to go back to Alan's excellent point about fundraising, there was a bit of a contract that's possible. When you look at the language and language that's used, that this was a binding legal agreement between Ananias and Sapphira and who? The conference. Huh? The conference. <laughs> yes. <And> Walter, <laughs> Walter always likes to ruin a perfectly good time. <laughs> throwing some salty twists into it. Oh, and now we're pissed. Don't kids pump bad behavior. That's not how we run here. One week, Rod, I turned the class and this is what happened. <laughs> So, no, but that's right. It's a contract between Ananias and Sapphira. This is private property. By the way, women could own private pro property in the Roman Empire. And we think, given this story, that both Ananias and Sapphira held deed to this property. Okay? So this is not a paternalistic situation. This is not a marriage situation where there's a... Um, um, there's not probably an imbalance. Thank you. There's probably not an imbalance of power. And you kind of get that. I mean, when you read it, there's not a Sapphira's no victim here, right? She's not a she so so scholars think that probably this deed was held by the, as a couple together. A willing participants. Willing participants. So she's she's intel she knows what's going on. And so John's uh, a candidate here for what the sin is that this is a lie, and it's a lie in the form of there was a contract with a particular agreement, and now you've gotten the lawyers um, to um, shift the language around to indicate there's two set of books, right? I mean, this is a passage about two sets of books. One bill of sale over here, James. This is what happened. And then the actual bill of sale over here. Two, two sets of books. The classic account. It's a, it, this is an incentive accounting. Or at least that's the application, right? I'll get my dad in here. Yeah, right. I mean, well, that's what this is. And so we think because of the language in the Greek that there was this was not the church just ran. Hey, who'll give five bucks? Who'll give ten bucks? You know, this is not that there actually probably was a pretty formal way that the church was, and you saw them last week. People were selling property in an organized fashion to pour into this new movement that was moving. This wasn't haphazard. This wasn't just emotional. Like, there was an actual thought here. Okay? So there's a lie. Anything else you want to say about the, the, the nature of the sin to color that in a little bit? Disconnected. Say more about disconnected. By, by, the, by the act, they subconsciously or consciously knew they were disconnecting themselves from God. Okay. So there's there's a separate contracts or covenants. <coughs> so this is both a contract and a covenant. And the covenant is breaking relationship in a couple different ways, right, right Randy, with God. Um, so uh, so this is the what. So let me bleed into let me bleed a little bit into the why in a second. And we'll, we can come back and forth. The, the way you phrase it when you're talking a legal contract it at least implies because of their intelligence that this is probably not the first act of fraud they have. Committed. Oh, like you said, this was a very deliberate choice, and typically people don't make that deliberate choice all of a sudden. 
They have a track record. So I, I, well, through your speculation, do they have a track record? That's interesting. Interesting, right? So Bert Vine right. says that Peter Yar that uh, her sin was testing the spirit of the Lord. Yes. So it seems like a little power play there. Yeah. Never test the spirit of the Lord. Um. So. What does that mean? I mean, it's an interesting phrase. If you and I use that on each other, we would think, where do you come off saying that to me, right? I mean, don't test the spirit of the Lord. And you'd be like, Alex, I think you're a little too big for your britches, right? I mean, that's an interesting phrase. They're tying this to something. I mean, to go back to Walter's comment, if the conference or some church leadership used that phrase, most of us in this room wouldn't, wouldn't appreciate that too much, I would imagine. Would we? We're a little too Protestant for that language. So testing the Lord. Huh. And the question, does that imply that her motivations were different and so the sin is different? <clears throat> you mean in, in, in the, in the case of... Like is, is Sapphira's sin yeah. different than the husband's? Or, does, or is this looped into the... To both of them? I mean, I mean, that's an interesting question. What the, the dominant character? The dominant character in the Acts story to this point has been whichever one of you said has been the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, who's been who has been the lead actor in this story? Holy Spirit has been the lead actor. What did Jesus say in Acts one? Just sit here and wait for the Holy Spirit, right? And the Spirit's poured out, and the Spirit's poured out again, and the Spirit's poured out again, and the Spirit inspired. I mean, the the, the, the Acts, the, 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 the title of this book, sometimes we call it the Acts of the Apostles. I was taught way back in undergraduate days by my New Testament professor, it's really better titled the Acts of the Spirit. Because it's not really the Apostles' action that's central, it's the Spirit. Right? You know, so so I think what I think what this is getting at is this business that's going on here is not merely a violation against a human organization, it's against a spiritual organization. So, would you agree? Is that, is that fair enough? Mm -hmm. So this, this, is, this is actually a statement of humility. You're not, this is not between us, Delana. This is, a, this is about God because this is bigger than us. Does that make sense? And so, and so it, it kind of, it, it does raise the stakes, but not sort of in a hyperbolic or weird way. It, it raises the stakes to where the issue actually sits, which is this is a story of the spirit. <laughs> and therefore, when you start messing with this, you're messing with the spirit. You're not just messing with another business transaction to John's point that may have happened previously. Well, related to what John said and related to this, did they have a track record and Peter suspected this was going on or did they maybe not have a track record? Yeah. And the spirit was actually talking to sure. Peter and saying, hey, Ask him about this. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's always interesting to, to, to think about the backstory. So so I guess the question, I'm going to pivot now. Um, we'll still stay with the what, but the what is what's going I ask you, what's going on here? The second question I think we ask when we go to the scriptures is, what, why did Luke, the historian, include this story? That's the next question. <laughs> Why did Luke put this story in? So imagine as a historian, you have access to countless stories. I mean, just, you know, the, the volume would have been incredible. Even John said at the end of his history of Jesus, I suppose that all the libraries of the world could contain all the stories we could tell about Jesus. Remember that little phrase at the end of John? So, so the historian Luke is making choices is the point. Why this story? Why are we reading it today? Because he chose to put it in there. Plus and minuses. Say that again. Positive and negative. Yes. Stories. So the first one. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why this story? I think it's Good. your point that it is pointing to the spirit. It's, it's, it's basically setting the stage that our contracts are with God, not a human construct. Okay. Like it, it's pointing to this idea that it's not about. The synagogue is not about the church. It's not about this. It is now about. Okay. Here. So, so your your the case you're making is 
that the inclusion of this story is to focus our minds on I'm trying to think of the right word here, but the, the sacredness or the mission or the, the the lofty thing that's going on here somewhere. Yes. Yeah. I mean, more so to the point of that it's a paradigm shift. It's not just a focus shift. Yeah. Your whole your whole reality is different now. Yeah. It's, it's not about the sacrificial system. It's about yeah. Okay. So good. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. It's a cautionary tale. It's caught. What is it cautioning us against? Pride, fraud, Fra fraud, disconnection yeah. with the spirit. Yeah. Uh, we have greed up there, but the re reason for the greed maybe was that they were trying to uh, attain status within the community at a bargain rate. Okay. <laughs> And actually, you should you should write a commentary because uh, some of the commentators actually use a phrase very similar to what you said. They didn't come along and say, oh, we've decided instead of giving 100 percent, we're going to rewrite the contract and we're only going to give 25. They, they could have done that. Do you notice that they could have renegotiated the contract? And Peter points that out. Isn't that, yeah. That's not what they decided to do. What they decided to do was. Let's keep the story because we like what the story says about us. And I think John Stott, the Anglican theologian, says they wanted to buy influence on the cheap. Mm -hmm. Isn't that it? No. Right. They wanted to buy influence on the cheap. They, they wanted to virtue, virtue signal that they were these big time givers and generous, mm -hmm. but they wanted to do it without actually paying the price. Mm -hmm. And there's a word for that. And the word did not come up here, and it's a word we use for the Pharisees and stuff, but it's a, what, what's the word? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Yeah. Hypocrisy. Um, There's a better word. It's called fake news. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. It's like, in, we're talking about motives and impure motives, and um, in Amos 5, it says, I hate you in these things. I despise your sacred assembly. Uh, Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And he says, take away from me the noise of all your work. Songs. Yeah. Take away from me the knowledge of your straight Yeah. But let justice run down. Yeah. You know, and, and God is, he cares very much. It says, let justice run down in righteousness. Like I'm going to be streaming. And, and uh, I, I mean, it's a retelling of, of, of motive behind, behind uh, I mean, like Melissa was saying, he points out like, this was yours. Yeah. This You didn't have to give this much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yet God despises a sacrifice made in that faith. Yeah, in that that's right, faith. Seth. No, I love this phrase you have here. Uh, religion without justice or the public practice of spirituality without integrity is a real problem. Right. It's a it's a significant. Problem. Um, what was the what was the potential damage to the community when I asked the why question? Like. What, what was the what was the potential damage to the community because of this? So go back two thousand. Like what what was the what was the severity of the problem? I mean, there's a lot of sin. There's a lot of imperfections, right? So you're, you're right. What what's the problem here? What what's the unique problem here? It casts doubt on the whole community from within and from without. Okay. So it's casting doubt. Good. What else? <laughs> What's the problem here? The immediate problem. I mean, what is the... I, I want to remind you that two people dropped dead. In the same book, by the way, Acts, the same history, where Paul... Is the Acts 15, there's people doing this and people doing that. People are eating food, sacrificed to idols. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that is being accommodated in Acts. Wide hospitality of accommodating people that are in all kinds of different places, but not here. My Bible has a question mark under why did you do such a thing? Did they have a chance? Did he have a chance to say, I, I'm sorry, I was wrong, da, da, da. It feels that way, doesn't it, Lois? I mean, it, it, it seems like there was a bit of a discussion. There was some opportunity. So 
again, I mean, does that make like you read the book? If you read the book of Acts this afternoon through, you would say this is this big man, magnanimous book that's inviting in new cultures, new peoples. It's actually accommodating a lot of nonsense. It's accommodating what we call sin. It's saying we've got to make this thing as big as possible for the sake of the spirit. And it's going to be very messy and imperfect. But here, two people dropped dead. I mean, I mean that we can't pass over that over something. Something's different here than it is in all these other cases where things are going awry. Right. So I have two questions. And I don't want to throw things off kilter. But my wife just asked me why Trump didn't die when he held up the Bible and the last day at part. So that's a little aside. <laughs> Is she appreciative of the fact that you just said that? <laughs> but have another discussion. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, you know, are we going to get to what this says about the nature of God? We we should. I, and, and that's why I'm asking this question, because the nature of God, generally in the book of Acts, seems to be, again, maximum sort of accommodation for all kinds of stuff, but not here. By the way, there's another instance in Acts where this kind of thing happens. Do you know what it is? It's actually outside the church, but something happens very similar to this. Remember Herod? Remember the story? What what is what happens to Herod? He has a more interesting death. Worms. worms. You remember the worms eat him mm -hmm. because he um, was proclaiming that he was somehow divine. Remember that story? So you have a you have another instance where this happens, yeah, Tim. Well, I just looked up the story in Wikipedia while we were reading, and there is a couple of very negative comments. But one of them suggests that maybe there was a problem in the early church that it was kind of becoming compulsory, where you'd have to sell everything and give it to the church to be a member. I don't see that in the text. Do you? No, I don't see that in the text. Well, it says everyone sold what they had. Yes, it's true. Well, it certainly becomes the habit. Well, you tell me if you join any organization and everybody seems to be doing this thing, you know, or you or or Seth, uh, the boys on the bat, there's one guy that doesn't want to like run the, the what are they called? The suicide sprints or whatever. Yeah, pretty soon you're going to figure out whether, whether you want to be part of that or not. Jack? I tried to say this last week, but Tim didn't pay attention. <laughs> it is not and it's commonly said that everybody sold everything it was a communism everything was common if you read the text it's a plural those that had houses and lands sold them nobody sold their house yeah they sold when they had two houses or five houses they sold the houses. That's an interesting observation. So it, yeah. you know, it's not a communism. Yeah, it, it is a generosity of spirit, but it came from those who could. So you know, I don't think it's possible to blame the Holy Spirit because they weren't being communists. They didn't sell it. Yeah. This Ananias and Sapphira were people of means. Yeah, they had houses and they had lands, and they sold one of them. Yeah. So, I mean, that let's put it in that context. Yeah. And by the way, I think I put economic theory up here was my own contribution. This passage is decidedly not about how nation states should form their economies. Can we just be clear about that? I have a book on my shelf that says that God's way is capitalism. I have another book on my shelf that says God's way is socialism. And guess what? God's way is neither. It has nothing to do with economic theory. It has to do with how the church is going to function. It's a very a, that's a very different question. I think to extrapolate this into other things is uh, here and then over here. Um, do you think the year of jubilee was in practice? Would property <laughs> have been returned after a certain amount yeah. of time? What's interesting, at least some of you may have a better read on this. What's interesting about the year of jubilee, where you have this massive sort of forgiveness of all debts in Leviticus, we don't have a lot of historical evidence that actually this actually ac happened. Does that make sense? So it was this ideal, but we don't see it which is interesting, um, sort of this clearing of the deck, um, like when my brothers and I would play Monopoly and like it all goes back in the box at the end, right? We're going to start afresh. There really is not a lot of evidence of, which is interesting historically. It's, it's a notion, but it doesn't, you don't see a lot of times where you have. Well, thinking like you were saying, because here you have two people who dropped dead. 
And I was thinking a little bit, maybe because of where I work, how in a justice system, intent is such a major part oh. of the punishment. Yeah. And so intent yeah. typically is treated very differently than a, quote, crime of passion. Yes. Yeah. So, so I, I want to come back to, I want to come back to it for a second. The, the book of Acts as a canvas, hospitable, inviting, allows for a lot of stuff. Not here. Oh, I've, I've missed some hands. Yes. Well, this whole story to me would suggest that there's something going on here we don't know. Oh. And it may well have to do with the character of these two people. They may have been troublemakers. We don't know. Yes. But why were they singled out? There's something in the story we don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that goes to the issue. Was there history? The jet right? Was there history? Is there something we don't know? Anna? So my Bible uh, references Deuteronomy 23, 21. And it says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it will be sin to you. Yeah, uh, okay. Pretty direct. So it's saying that they made a vow. Yeah. yeah. And I think, actually, I think going back to Aiken, I know I've got a couple hands here. I think, I think going back to the Aiken story is relevant because you remember when Israel was coming out of Egypt as slaves, there were very strict rules about how the community was going to function. Read, read the Torah, right? Exactly. You know, where you were going to go to the bathroom and what's going to happen if you have a skin disease and exact because there had to be in, in order for this community to work, vows had to be honored. Right. I mean, you go you had to you had to kind of do what you said you were going to do. And it had to be pretty well structured. So Rod and Jerry. Okay. It kind of on to something when you talk about coming out of Egypt, their community was in dire circumstances. And so the consequences of violating a social construct or a way of behaving were maybe more significant than they were 500 years later in the same, with the same people. Talk about later in the New Testament where, you know, I can eat anything I want. I don't care if it's offered to idols. That's not a big deal. Those are social things that a violation of them doesn't cause real and significant damage maybe in the moment. But I think this might be talking about that's all, that's one thing, but there is a line that you don't cross with God. Mm -hmm. And I think that vow goes to that, that that's different yeah. than the social constructs that we have. Because things that are okay in our society in college place may be not okay somewhere else. I'm not sure God looks at that the same way, that those kinds of differences of behavior as he does with how we relate to him. And yeah. I think the lie was to him, to test the, to test of the spirit, both of them. It was both of them, he said, is that, that you're lying to the spirit. You're testing the spirit. So I think the vow is with God, and that's different. There's a line that you just don't get to cross. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, good, Rod, really good reflection. Jerry? I'm not going to try to try to um, answer anything here. I, I just find it interesting. I have to be careful how I say this. Um, in proximity to an elementary school teacher, but I find it interesting that um, these are stories, Aiken, you know, touching the, touching the ark, this story. These are stories that, these, maybe it was just my elementary school, that we learned these things when we were young. Um, then we haven't talked about this for a long time. And, and it seems to me, <laughs> you know, um, and why is it that, that this seems appropriate for, for more immature Christians um, to be set out and hear kids consume this and learn the lesson that that's here, um, rather than maybe held back from kids um, and presented maybe when we have a little bit more of a mature mm -hmm. um, um, perspective on things. I, I, I sit here and I ask my question, well, why is this story something that I remember? Yeah. But it's not something that that I've had to be, I've had to consume for such a such a long time. But I do remember these troubling stories uh, okay. from elementary school. Um, I don't know. It just seems. It just seems. And you're asking why did Luke choose to choose to uh, include this? And I'm and I'm, I'm trying to think. Is it possible that he understood that the further they got away from Jesus, the person, and the more at this. 
this was about the institution and you know all, all this other kind of stuff and, and needing to have um, that maybe there were going to be people who had a little bit more of an immature understanding of relationship and that it was an important lesson for people that are at a little bit more of an immature stage to have that while they yeah. while they learned to trust and, yeah. and love the person of, of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Yeah. No, I think your observation is right. And I think for parents, you know, there's some Bible stories that are inappropriate for children. I just be clear about that. I know that may offend. The Bible, the Bible's built where some passages are designed for some and some for others. And I don't think I'm speaking heresy. Or you change the details of the story, like Esther is a beauty pageant. Yeah. <laughs> and and I'm not not Scott, somebody said that's not. <laughs> Um, and my, my point is, it's not wrong to do that, is that part of truth is, it, truth is about context, friends, and doing things that are beneficial, right? Paul says, you, you have the right to do something, but that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, right? And so I think that, I think there's truth in that. I, can I ask a little bit of a different question? Because we're all worried about what God is up to here. I know we're worried. Does it say that God kills them? Read the passage. I'm dead. Scary. Does it say that God struck them dead? Ah, huh, that's interesting. I don't think it says that God struck them dead on either in, in either case. Does it does Peter interpret this as divine um judgment? Judgment, thank you. Right, right? as ju ju yes. <laughs> but does God, but is God the in, is God stated as the instigator here? I don't see it. And when I was studying for this week, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Hands. Yes. <laughs> Back to the nature of God. Um, there are some things that God hates. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm also reminded, by the way, that if I, I've said this in this class before, if I kill someone, I can't bring them back to life. If God chooses to remove someone's capacity to breathe air and their heart to beat, can can God bring that person back to life in the future? That has helped me tremendously as I think about when you think about entire cities that were killed in the Old Testament, you know, some of these stories that are really hard the, the fact that God can bring back life is a, it puts God in a very different category in terms of the termination of life. Does and that make sense? Hmm? And this world is not our yeah. home. It, yeah. it is not the yeah. ultimate end. Right. I just, I, I, I always, I tell my students here, in, like, when you're talking about life and death issues, we can have that conversation here. But then you have to have that conversation of reflective of a, of a different kind of being. By the way, as parents, you see this all the time because big sister can tell little brother to do something and it does not go well. And when mom and dad say it, it's a different, you follow what I'm saying? And I think we have to be careful not just to equate all of God's actions as if he were human like us. Because, because God thinks in millennia and eternity and we think differently but having said all that a bit of an apologetic for god i guess uh, trying to make an apology in this passage it does not say that god killed them i think that the sheer expediency at which these people were buried tells us that some in the room were unsure of their death or at least they didn't want to raise questions as to how they died interesting because who buries her husband before even notifying the wife? Yeah, and in interesting. And there are some cleanliness issues going on too. Yeah, that's very interesting. I didn't think about that. that's a really interesting detail. They, they buried him quick. Well, that adds some intrigue into the story <laughs> for sure. Yeah, history is written by the victors, and so yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't say that God kills them, but it doesn't say that man killed them either. Was that just a detail that was left out to make the cautionary tale work better? Yeah. Most people die without being killed. So yes. th these people died, but that they were killed is not 
put by anything there. So, you know, what, what you and I are hoping is that they just had an acute myocardial infarction. Yeah. No, and I, I read, and Jack, I think it's probably too creative reading of the text. But I thought the same thing when I was reading it is this does have the possibility of the weight of what they had done was so heavy that it could have arrested their arrested their their heart. I mean, the, I we mean, don't we don't know how old they were. If they were 85, yeah. then you and I are right. If they were 25, no. But but one could but but you know I don't I don't so let me just say I don't think we have to find a rational explanation of this to try to let God off the hook because I think if God had chosen if the text said to us today that God killed them I I would think that that would not change that should not change anything for us does that make sense otherwise our faith in God is contingent on nouns and verbs in one particular particular passage. Does that make like in one passage? I'm merely saying when I read the text, it struck me, it doesn't say God killed them. But I do think are, are we so fragile in our kind of understanding of the God of Jesus Christ and what Jesus reveals that a noun and a verb and how it said it would change everything. You, you follow what I'm like what I'm using on like I think to go that that becomes a problem. So uh, I'll come up this way, Rod, and then I'm struggling. The Hardys are both wanting to weigh in on this one. Yeah. I want her to go second, just, you know, <laughs> rebuttal. I'm struggling a little bit with that idea because who ultimately has, decides life and death, ultimately? I mean, if we think we're going to live forever after we're resurrected, who has that power? And so to say he didn't kill them yeah. is to say that he had no choice in the matter because Sure. Will they be resurrected <laughs> yeah. and go to heaven? I don't know. Right. But he could do that, right? right. And so if, if that's really where the power ultimately lies, yeah. then to not act and allow someone to die, what's the difference? Yeah. If that's really where all the power really, really relies. Someone could, God could stop someone from, you know, shooting me and killing me that way. And he could stop me from having a heart attack when I'm. So 90. God's on the hook either way is what you're saying. I think so. Yeah. So you you flatten out the bioethical dilemma, by the way, uh, of do I cause the patient's death through lack of giving them what they need, or do I cause the patients because I put something in their IV? Right. I mean, in either case, you kind of have the power. Right? Seems that way. All right. I know there's a hand at the back. So. The Hardys are going to weigh in. This is going to be interesting. Is this a debate? I hope this will be interesting. <laughs> in that case, I just told. <laughs> uh, my that's a slight shift, but I, I think this point of them dying is there's these little spatterings of stories in the Bible where there's these very dramatic events, like the touching of the ark. It's like it was really the intention of the touching of the ark that killed them, not necessarily the touching of the ark. Right. That can be argued, so intent. Yeah. But I think here the story is included again to send home the message of how important your intent is when you're dealing with spiritual things. And one thing is um, the chapter concentrate consecration and steps to Christ, which is all about giving of your entire will to God and concentrating your entire self and all that you are to God. He kind of summarizes at the end and it kind of plays to what maybe they were trying to do where it says desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if they stop here, they will avail nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. If they do not come to the point of yielding the will to God, they do not now choose to be Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very dramatic exclamation mark to this idea. I don't think God's going to, you know, kill everybody who is wavering on their will to God. But I think it's kind of an exclamation mark, like, I need you to understand this lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to say again, there's lots of wavering in Acts, friends. Mm -hmm. I keep coming back to this. You have to see this in the context of all of the other completing letting, letting people off the hook in the rest of the book. Because, anyways, Anna, and then there's at least a dozen hands right now. All I was going to say is it's pretty clearly implied. I mean, what's, what's the odds of the timing of people dying that way? Right next to each other. Uh, I mean, wise. I mean, it's playing like, the odds, are we? I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, Causation know. versus correlation, and yes. yeah. And, yeah, and I think Hannah's point is also right. 
it's clear that the church interpreted that God's hand was in this. So I'm not trying to suggest that, but I, clear, clearly that's how Luke's telling the story. So um, let's sweep through the whole room here. Yes. To me, it's simple. Sin killed them. The wages okay. of sin is death. Okay, He's sin. The author of sin. Okay. Lucifer. Good. And Thank Satan's you. name is mentioned in this passage, right? Satan put it in your heart, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's another interesting piece. Is, P is Peter talking, I think, at that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Peter is raising the stakes even then to what's really going on here, which is interesting. Um, in the back, uh, Tom, I know I saw your hand for sure. This strikes me just very briefly as better living through fear. And very close to that. Yes. Very close. I it, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I, Tom, I am too, except I'm going to say it now for the seventh time. But I have to take this story yeah. against the whole story of Acts where people are getting let off the hook all over the place for not being fully committed, for not, I mean, so yes, but it doesn't, it's not just rapid fire. Does that make sense? And I think that's, is your hand up in the back somewhere? Like, it was a while ago. <laughs> um, I guess I was what I was thinking is apart from God killing. What what about their own sudden realization? Mm. Uh, wow, I hadn't thought of it that way. Did I really do that? I mean, you know, just yeah, their sin killed them, or maybe that may, maybe they're just the overwhelming self certainly. I mean, who knows? Certainly. Like, cause of death might be hard to, to, to pin here. Um, Randy and Seth, um, and then Fred. Partly, it, it's kind of like um, parents don't treat their kids the same. They treat them justly, and but one kid you don't treat the same as the other kid. You don't need to. It's different. Yeah. But also, in <laughs> situational ethics kind of because in certain circumstances it's different and in school there's many many things that in first grade you're taught is absolute or in ninth grade is absolute math physics and other things and it turns out not to be but at the level that someone is capable or level of understanding and maturity in actual age or in thought process of whatever the context is changes. Yeah, good. No, excellent. Excellent. I never advanced far enough in math to know that it would So you're disrupting my whole framework. <laughs> that the documentary out on Tom Brady right now, it's on TV 12. It's very interesting. Um, Bill Belichick, the coach of the New England Patriots, goes and talks to Tom Brady and says, just so you know, I'm going to be hard on you when that practice today. Mm -hmm. And Tom Brady accepted the role of a sacrificial lamb. And it was interesting. All these young guys come into the thing. And after their first game, he tells the story of these young guys that came on the team talking about Tom Brady. Coach Bill, he, he goes in their bell check and he shows this video. And then he goes into a tirade, just destroying Tom Brady. Here's one of the greatest of all time. And when all these young guys see that even Tom Brady doesn't get off the hook, I mean, Mm -hmm. You would think that maybe he gets a pass. Maybe the rich get a pass, or maybe the spiritual get a pass, or maybe, and you realize, oh no, my good, you know, he, he treats him almost harder than anyone else, and it created a culture yeah. where no, we're all accountable. It doesn't it doesn't matter if you're the quarterback on the team, or, or the and, and it, it created a culture of success and a culture of accountability. Mm -hmm. And Tom Brady was the sacrificial lamb in that, and, Bill, and basically Bill Belichick told Tom Brady, "This is what we have to do to get the culture that I'm going for." Yeah, it's very interesting to look backwards at what that's happens. a good uh, yeah i like that observation seth i mean even who does jesus go after hard in the gospels Mercy. it's leaders right i mean it's different it's leaders and it's his own disciples who are going to be leaders does jesus after just ever really go after someone that's not in a position of sort of power? i don't think so. not really really it's it's usually you know the quarterback so, good that's good so the phrase acts of god comes to my mind it's a phrase we, we use now we generally use it for things we don't understand mm -hmm. and but maybe we do a little bit and we still call them acts of god mm -hmm. i don't think they really describe god's character the same way well, here 
I think this might be an act of the spirit, but it doesn't really describe the spirit. And I would say rather, we're trying to say here, this story, that life is serious. There's other stories that tell us about the nature of God and the spirit. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I think Fred, we use the phrase acts of God now in a Western sort of modern sense, in the ancient world, everything was an omen or, or, or a, an action of God. You follow me? Like, I mean, if you've ever watched like a documentary on Rome or a movie set in the, I mean, everything, they were very supernatural in their thinking and almost everything that happened to you had some relationship to the transcendent. And I think the commentators also think that that's a piece of this too, that it would be normal for them to think God, the gods were involved, or in this case, monotheism, you know, you know, God was involved in some way. Um, the one, the one word, or a couple words we didn't put up on the phrase early. I'm kind of pivoting to the how this applies to us. Is one, uh, one conversation is around the issue of church discipline, which nobody likes to talk about, and did the church need to protect it? Like so it's, it's like the counter narrative, right? So it's. Well, what if what if they had let the, these two off the hook? So that's kind of the counter there, right? What was the problem in letting off, off the hook? And we've talked this morning about the problem is it could have badly damaged trust, covenant in the church to the point where, I mean, you could argue maybe it would have blown the whole project up, right? It was a problem, so it had to be dealt with. And so one piece of, we don't like to talk about it, is church discipline and the role of, when does the church, when does a group of people, maybe that's better than the word church, which always sounds like somebody in, at the Vatican or somebody in, you know, somewhere far off of it. But when does a group of people have to say, no, we're not going to tolerate this? And that's, I, I think that that becomes... When you think about the why, why this was so important and how we apply it, I have to read it and go, okay, what, what are we supposed to, you know, how are we supposed to apply this? What, what, what do we do with this story? What am I supposed to do? Okay, personally, I don't want to act like them. I'm going to live up to my pledges and I'm going to pledge less because somebody might chuck a shoe from half court, right? So I better be careful what I'm promising. I mean, we can have all these personal lessons for it and I don't want to behave like them. But in one sense, it's a statement about how is it that we're protecting community? And are there some things that are just not um, permissible because of the damage that they're going to do to the community? Does that make sense? Like, it feels like that's a big part of the story. To some degree, is like the community has rights, if you will. Right? The community has to, there are some things that are going to be a threat. I don't know, Rod? That comment makes me think about Peter's role in all of this. Years and years ago, I was in a grocery store. I saw a kid stick a candy bar in his pocket. I just walked up behind him and said, you don't want to do that. And he took the, put it back and left the store. <laughs> when she comes in, he could have said, your husband just came in and told us that you gave all the money. We just buried him. Did you really give all the money? <laughs> he could have said that. But what's his role in this? Would they both have died whether, no matter what he said? Was there a chance to say to her, are you sure you want to go down this path? Because here's where it led. I don't know. I don't know what his role is or was or should have been. Yeah. He's clearly playing the role, Rod and everyone. I mean, he's clearly playing the role as a leader of the community. I mean, he's, they're acting as apostles that are trying to protect the community in a sense, and you can quibble with how they did it or not, but they clearly are understanding that they have a role to shepherd this group, and they're viewing this particular activity as so problematic that it needs to be dealt with. I mean, you see this in other places in the New Testament, too, not with maybe capital punishment, but I mean, doesn't Paul say to the man that's in a relationship with his mother or mother-in-law, we can't have this here. Right? I mean, wasn't that kicked out of the church? 
I mean, you have a few of these instances where things are so so troubling that, it, that at least, I mean, again, we can argue with those leaders if we want, but those early leaders made decisions that said, there are some things that aren't going to work here. And that maybe makes us uncomfortable, but th that's a, you know, that's a, a, a piece of how they were keeping the peace, right? John? The difficulty as humans is rejecting the behavior without rejecting the person. Yeah. And that was what Jesus set an example of. Like, even when he was kind of ripping the Pharisees, he never once hated them. The behavior, yes, but not the individual. And as humans, we tend to mix the two. We tend to reject the individual and the behavior. And that's not easy. That, that's not an easy line. tease, right? Correct. You know, for those that have wielded a knife in a human body, how easy is it to tease the bad stuff from the good stuff? I mean, I'm sure it's not easy right and and so we say things like i mean you're right and then also that's challenging uh, it is um it is a uh, at times jerry i would say as humans just going off of what he just said we 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 make it even worse because we decide who we don't like and then we look for the behavior um, and then we look for the examples of why we're right why we're justified <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think in this instance, at least, you know, maybe some of the other things we've talked about don't fall in this. But in this instance, at least, the circle of what was acceptable and unacceptable was about. I mean, hypocrisy was a was the problem, right? I mean, it was they were they were lying to the, they were lying to God, they were lying to the community, they were they were sowing seeds of mistrust, and it just you can't have that. Does that make sense? Like. You just, it's not going to work for the preservation of the community. And I often think, I know we got to go here, but I often think in church, in my, at least my experience in church over the decades, we thought about church discipline. We picked on certain sins that we thought, well, that one deserves to be on the list. And it makes no sense at all where I could, I could give you several examples like gossip totally blows up community. Are you with me? Totally. That would be on my list for church discipline. And there's been a time or two in my 30 years as a pastor where I've had to tell someone, you're not welcome here anymore because you won't stop. Does that make sense? You know, so we often put things on the list for church discipline that aren't actually blowing the church up. And we excuse things that are actually really corrosive and, and damaging to the body. And, and I think, you know, violence, verbal violence. I mean, you can think about things that just destroy churches, right? That are they that they they destroy people, and I think that's somehow I think that maybe the backstory maybe that we don't know what's going on, right? So, very last comment because we are over. Um, to the point of how do we apply this <clears throat> discipline? Uh, to John's point that Christ, you know, he did not reject the person and the behavior, just the behavior. I think as humans, we have to do also look good as it as Christ was, but he first reached out to the soul and then he reached out to the behavior mm. and i think we also need to reach to the soul and then correct the behavior yeah. and maybe that does go to the issue of we don't know what's gone on prior to this in the lives of these individuals maybe maybe remediation was attempted in many many different ways that's that's certainly possible all right lois will you pray for us before we leave please gracious god as we stumble towards the kingdom we are so grateful for your love, your kindness, and your grace to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good Thanksgiving. If you pledged any money, make sure you deliver that number. Don't have any issues over the week. That's going to be a lesson to you. Next week, you'll know why. I'm not here next week,